no that's all so welcome to this let's start with the session uh, your th third session with you on reinforcement learning Thanks, uh, Purna, for pointing this out. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, please uh, uh, download the uh, uh, artifacts from the URL that I have uh, posted here. This will be required for uh, our session later. And if you have not registered to log uh, Kaggle, please go and register to Kaggle and log in into it. This will be required later by uh, like for, for us for our session. And also, I pasted my LinkedIn uh, profile. If you have any further questions after the session, or you want to hit me up with uh, some marketing related questions uh, in data science, uh, feel free to uh, reach out. Aruna, I have shared the link. Let me share it again. I think the chat is carry forward, right, for the new participants when they join. Hopefully, not sure. Okay. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give like two, three minutes for more folks to join if they want, and then uh, everyone here to uh, you know log into Kaggle. This is the URL for Kaggle if you want it handy. Else it's a company acquired by Google, so if you just search for it, you should be able to find it. Great. Okay, so we can uh, start. I'll start the presentation. So welcome everyone again. Uh, hopefully you had a good lunch. Generally, the sessions after lunch is uh, kind of very difficult, both for the presenter and uh, for the people who are listening. Um, you know, like, so if you want to grab a cup of coffee, tea, whatever you feel like, uh, feel free to uh, get it uh, on your um, desk so that uh, you can have a right or whenever you feel sleepy, just, uh, you know, try to take a few deep breaths and you will you'll get back to the session. So just be there with me for another one hour, 30 minutes, and then uh, hopefully uh, it will be worth your time. So... <clears throat> Let's start with reinforcement learning. Uh, so a little bit of context, you know, why reinforcement learning is actually required, right? So let me just first go a little bit towards neural network, right? And I have not gone too much into detail about neural network, but uh, most of my work and research is actually in the area of neural network because neural networks are generally very hungry uh, algorithms, data hungry algorithms. And in marketing, uh, we have a lot of data. So Clickstream generates a lot of data. So what is, what is basically Clickstream? So Clickstream is basically as the customers go on a website and they go around clicking things, each and every action that the customer takes is being recorded. So like how much time you spent on a particular page, what uh, URL did you click, uh, which image you browse to, how much time you spend on that image, each and everything that you are doing when you go on any website, be it Amazon, Mintra, or anyone, any of the e-commerce websites, uh, you know, Marriott or anyone, uh, Adobe, uh, every piece of information is being captured and then is used to basically market relevant uh, products to you. Now, uh, why did we go towards neural network? So we were making consistent progress using our statistical. Uh, 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, where was we? Uh, okay, so yeah, so neural network, right? So basically, we were doing great with our statistical methods and uh, mathematical models, but we were still not able to get near human efficiency in a lot of tasks that were, uh, you know, uh, very uh, easy for humans. Like, for example, if <clears throat> you are shown an image of a cat or a dog, so you can immediately tell whether it is a cat or dog. And uh, for a machine learning model, it's generally very difficult to figure out a very simple thing like that, right? And so what we just tried to do was create uh, machine learning models which would replicate the way human beings uh, basically behave and how what we end up doing was neural networks. So neural networks is basically, you can imagine them as a set of neurons that in our body. And so the neurons are connected to uh, each other in a layered format in a specific way. Each neuron <clears throat> in our body or in our brain have a weight that is assigned to it. And as synapses passes through those neurons, uh, they get enhanced or decreased based on the weight of that particular neuron. And then uh, the main advantage that these neurons provide is that they give a non-linearity to our whole uh, inference uh, structure. So basically every time the synapses exit a particular neuron, uh, they are uh, basically um, uh, multiplied with a particular uh, kind of um, um, uh, weight so that uh, they basically um, 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 provide a known linearity. And we used very similar concepts in neural networks uh, when we start building it. And now neural networks have gone to a level that they have a very similar or even better uh, accuracy in a lot of uh, uh, areas, for example, NLP, image processing, sound processing and related areas uh, for, for, for accuracy. Like in fact, uh, some of the models that are latest and greatest uh, state of the art have achieved better uh, accuracy uh, than even human beings. So with that, it, it made sense. And then um, uh, we wanted to do some of the things in the area of uh, games and uh, stuff like that as well. But what we found was that the traditional algorithms were not very well, even though we have we had Markov decision process, and we'll talk about that. What that exactly is uh, from very long time, but you know, figuring out that what we exactly need and Markov decision process have been there from the world of planning. Okay, so planning. What used to happen was that we will we, we planning is the closest area uh, to reinforcement learning. And basically in planning, what happens is that there is recorded data and based on that recorded data, there is an agent. Suppose there is a robot and uh, the robot is basically uh, responsible for figuring out how it has to navigate in a you know, maze. And so what would happen is that there will be uh, data which will already be there. And based on that data, the uh, robot will basically offline in an offline fashion learn uh the um the you know rules that it should execute or the policy that it should execute to basically go around the maze then reinforcement learning came into picture because in most of the places defining that data or defining that rules for the agent is really really difficult so like for example reinforcement learning has been able to defeat uh alpha go master and alpha go has so many different combinations than defining them in terms of rules is like really, really difficult. So we wanted to get something uh, through which a machine can automatically learn things. And that's where the reinforcement learning uh, took place. So in reinforcement learning, basically there is an environment and an agent, and then there is a reward process. So an environment is basically an, a place in which uh, the agent goes and act and the agent uh, is present in a particular state. Then every time, at every time stamp, the agent takes an action and by the virtue of that action the agent gets a neutral negative or positive reward and by the virtue of that uh, action 
the state of the user also change the state of the agent also changes now based on the reward the agent changes the belief of the system that the agent has and then it basically keeps on making its its belief better and better over time and uh, at the end it basically learns the optimal policy now reinforcement learning is a very broad area and a book that is recommended is a reinforcement learning book by berto and sutton which is basically the bible of uh, reinforcement learning if you want to get into this field uh, that's the recommended uh, book but uh, reinforcement learning has proven very well in basically uh, a lot of fields now if you want to see that what can the use be in a marketing kind of paradigm because we are basically exploring with reinforcement learning right now so here is a use case so suppose you go into a website on amazon.com right and uh, basically what we believe is that as soon as a customer comes in what amazon.com want is basically you should purchase and so if you should purchase what should be the external stimulus that should be given to you right so once you go onto a website you are in a particular state and then amazon.com is your environment and then you go into that website and do you do some actions right like so basically click here and there or you start browsing some products now every time you do that in each and every session if we can basically give you a reward and by the virtue of that reward and action pair if your state changes more towards you know converting your purchase uh, then uh, that would basically be uh, that then that would basically be a typical reinforcement learning problem so you are the agent in this case and then basically the environment is set up and then there is uh, the more and more um, um, research here goes into basically creating the optimal reward process in such a way that the conversion is the highest so th that's a good length of 10 minutes introduction to reinforcement learning and we will start with the presentation so uh, why reinforcement learning is important because you can imagine that you have to play a game where you don't know any rules about right so the uh, typical uh, example that we use for reinforcement learning is two fold so then one is basically a balancing a kind of stick uh, uh, example that they use and then also the ping pong game that 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 example is also used so the agent does not know the rule it just plays with itself and over time it's basically able to uh, learn ping pong in such a way that the ball is never dropped it can continue playing for hours because it exactly can predict that where the um, ball will go and in fact what it what the algorithm actually sees is just a set of pixels where the game is basically running on it does not see anything else it does not understand anything else it just basically a very simplistic cnn model which uh tries to understand you know what is the state of uh, the board at this point of time and then what action it should take whether it should move its handle left like the ping pong paddle left or right and uh, based on that it uh, if he if he's, if he's able to hit he gets a positive record reward say 100 if it's a miss he gets a negative reward say minus 100 and this based on this thing it starts very very naive and continuously um uh, learning right so Let's talk a little bit about MDP. So this is a standard uh, diagram for MDP, and we'll get back to that in a moment. But oh, first, what is more important is to talk about the Markovian property. So in the Markovian property, what we say is, and and this property is really really important because if you want to chase, like if you want to uh, 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 solve any uh, reinforcement learning problem, and if your uh, state space is not Markovian then you will not be able to basically use reinforcement learning so we do a lot of things actually in here as well at least in the marketing domain uh, to make sure that uh, we convert our uh, processes to mdps so that our state space is markovian so what we say uh, by a markovian space state space that the current state in itself is good enough to basically represent all the states that has that the agent has gone through in the past and if, if a agent environment system represents this uh, property then it we says that the uh, the the state space is Mar markovian in nature then what is a markov process so markov process is a randomless uh, 
memoryless random process and it is a sequence of states s1 and s2 uh, with markov property right so um, it's random because it's a markov process then when we go to markov decision process it's not random anymore and then markov process uh, or markov chain is a tuple uh, with a state space s and then a transition function p which defines that what is the uh, probability of uh, our agent to go from state s to state s dash so that's the transition function p right and then uh, adding on top of that uh, is a essential thing which is markovian reward process so markov reward process is nothing but a markov process with reward associated with each and every uh, step so every time you the agent takes a step it gets it start it takes an action and it changes its state from one state to another it starts getting a reward as well right and then it also has the concept of gamma here gamma is basically the discount factor so basically what happens is that over time uh, the uh, we want to make sure that the reward that you get from the current state transition is rated higher as compared to the rewards that you have got into the past and that's why we add gamma gamma is generally between 0 and 1 uh, else there will be a reward explosion for no reason if the gamma is greater than 1 and then uh, we basically use a uh, 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 geometric progression with gamma with every time every time uh, stamp uh, being um, uh, you know um, uh, we raise to the power of that gamma so that uh, the uh, uh, the rewards are discounted over time right so like for example at rt plus 1 the uh, uh, reward is taken as a whole, whereas at RT plus two, it is multiplied by gamma. And if uh, uh, if the gamma is less than one, of course we know that it would decrease its value. And if it we square gamma, then it will decrease its value further. So with every timestamp, the rewards that we got in the past keeps on are decreasing their value. And then comes the Markovian decision process. So in a Markovian decision process, it's a Markov reward process. Uh, with decision, right? So it's an environment in which all states are Markov, but the agent is just like can take decisions, and then that's why uh, there is a new uh, concept which comes in, which is called state transition probability. And so MDP is a tuple with S A P R Y, where S is our state space, A is the finite set of actions that can be taken in each and every state, P is the state transition probability. So state transition probability is that what is the probability of the user of the agent to transit from state at time t say s to state at time t plus one say s dash given that it takes action a right and then uh, there is also a concept of reward function and of course the discount factor discount factor is similar to what we discussed earlier and the reward function is basically what will be the reward expected reward so e stands for expectation here expected reward if the user uh, takes an action a in a state s at time t what would be the expected reward at the timestamp t plus one uh, that's basically uh,
Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, I think there was a, some network glitch and I lost connectivity. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. So a policy is basically something that a agent learns over time. And it's a belief that the agent start believing that, you know, if, uh, if it basically goes through this, uh, it will, it it's basically the basis on which it takes the actions on, right? It's basically the behavior. And then there also concept comes a concept of optimal policy. So from among all the policies, the optimal policy is the policy which helps the agent achieves the uh, you know uh, achieves the goal that it want, we want the agent to achieve so uh, in in the terms of reinforcement learning uh, basically we want to the agent wants to uh, maximize the discounted reward that it gets over time and the basically the optimal policy is from the policy space uh, if you go and search in the policy space the policy which basically gives the maximum reward okay so now with, with that said what is reinforcement learning right so um, um agent plays in an environment and must learn to behave optimally in it so you can take any uh suppose any uh robot and if you basically put it so so have you uh, guys heard about roomba so roomba is a very interesting uh kind of robot uh a lot of people in us use it for uh uh cleaning their houses so this is basically Roomba right and what it does is uh, you can watch a video it basically goes and cleans up your uh, house so it vacuums your house and so um, basically how Roomba would learn that uh, you know where to go into your house it can just go randomly here and there but it, it also tries to basically optimize it right and how it learns is that basically every time it is basically trying to go around your house, it will basically map your house in a certain way. And then it will learn the optimal policy that how it can basically try to uh, make sure that it is cleaning the house optimally. And uh, that's basically, it does not know anything about your house, but over the period, it has some very simplistic assumptions about the environment. And the assumptions are that, you know, if it go and hits a wall, uh then it basically gets a negative reward and then if it basically cleans the house successfully then it gets a positive reward and eventually it basically starts learning it and, and get it and so the goal is always to learn an optimal policy and the world behaves like an mdp uh, as we just discussed right so factors that make all difficult actions have non-deterministic effects right so initially you don't know uh, whether you will get a reward or not uh, what would be the so okay the non-deterministic effects are from the perspective of the agent. We already know what would be the rewards, right? Uh, so uh, basically also uh, most of the time the rewards, rewards are achieved at the end. So like for example, suppose the, uh, uh, the agent is playing Go Alpha, Alpha Go. And then what would happen is that uh, is playing the game Go. And then what will eventually happen is that if it wins the game, right? that's when it will basically earn the reward say 100 points and if it loses then it will earn minus 100 point or let's let's take an e easier example so if it's playing chess right so it will basically earn 100 points if it wins the game if it loses the game it will uh, earn negative 100 points so like let's imagine that it's beginning of the game so the agent will have to basically discount that reward which it is going to go get at the end to the first action that it took right and slowly move towards the final goal so in that sense the the reward that it will get immediately after taking that action is generally uh, not known and it is completely non deterministic right uh, and then rewards punishment can be infrequent as i mentioned um, often at the end of long sequence of actions how do we determine what actions were really responsible for reward or punishment so it is totally possible that the agent might have you know, played uh, some, you know, uh, step while playing chess and it might be wrong. But if, if he at the end of the day won the game, then should that move also considered as part of the win or not? And 
because we repeat this process again and again, ultimately that particular move will be removed from the optimal policy because it would make sure, like, uh, because by the property of this reinforcement learning system, it will make sure that uh, over time and multiple tries, this particular step is discounted punishment rather than reward. And word is large and complex. Like for example, uh, we can easily do it in terms of a game because if the if the agent loses the game, it doesn't matter. But if we take it into a mission critical kind of situation, so like for example, if we take this uh, agent and put it into Mars, where we would have spent millions of billions of dollars to basically even take this agent out to Mars, and uh, it takes some action, uh, and it's it's in a real world, and by virtue of that, uh, uh, it it goes on top of a volcano and gets erupted. And that's it. Billions of dollars are wasted. Sometimes it's really expensive in real world to uh, take the agent out and 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 learn these things. So, what is passive versus active learning? So, uh, so in a passive learning, what happens is that uh, uh, the agent acts based on a fixed policy and tries to learn how good the policy is by observing the world go by. So, we will tell the agent that okay, this is a policy that you have to execute. And then it will continuously execute on that policy, but it will basically keep on changing the uh, it will uh, keep on changing the policy, but uh, and 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 uh, not get not use it, but it will keep on changing the policy to get it better, slowly observing the world. And eventually, once it basically is able to figure out the best optimal policy, it will change the policy to the optimal policy, uh, and and discard the random policy that we gave it. Active learning, the agent literally goes inside. The environment or the world and um, uh, tries to solve for the mdp and basically tries to learn the reward and everything that would happen now uh, model based and model free uh, so basically what happens is that uh, um, uh, as i told you earlier um, uh, there might be a complete uh, uh, mdp model uh, that might be available and it will basically learn each and every variable of that mdp that is model based and if it's basically just a ping pong playing game where the uh, uh, reinforcement learning agent is basically trying to optimize its ping pong game, there is not literally a model available there or MDP available there, right? There are just two actions that it can take, whether move moving left or right, and it will basically learn the optimal uh, thing uh, based on uh, just a model free learning, right? And uh, uh, the passive information learning, reinforcement learning more details, so it assumes fully observable environment. So the environment is uh, fully observed, right? Like, so it basically is able to uh, figure out the reward and the punishment and the state space and the action. All of that is known to him, known to it by advance, right? Like, so state space is already known to it. Uh, the policy, uh, because it's passive learning, the policy is fixed. The behavior does not change. Um, and the agent learns how good each state is. And, uh, uh, it's policy evaluation. So basically you keep on evaluating your policy and making it better, but the trans transition function and reward function are not known, right? So why is it useful for future policy revision? So basically every time you go into the environment and even though you don't know the transition function and the reward function, but based on the policy evaluation, you make your policy revisions better and better. And that's how it happens. So like this is an example of passive reinforcement learning. Suppose we are given a policy. So the policy is here that uh, 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 if you are like, so you can be in any of these boxes. Uh, you basically, suppose if you are here at one, uh, what, what the policy is telling you, go up, go up, go right, go right, go right, and you will get plus one. And the other one is telling you, if you are at four, you basically go left, go left, up, 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 right, right? This is basically what it is telling. If you are here, you go up, go right, and it is basically taking you to plus one every time. It's not taking you to minus one. Now, if you want to learn that, uh, what is the efficiency of this particular uh, policy, you can basically go and then you can discount the uh, things, right? Like, so for example, there would be some discount factor here uh, that would be causing the discounting to happen. So plus one would be discounted to 0 0.918 here, uh, plus one would be discounted to 0 0.868 here, and so on and so forth. And it will basically uh, give you a gradient towards where we should move to get better, uh, you know, the, to get the better probability of getting to plus one. 
Um, yeah, so follow the policy for many epochs. And then here, what it is saying that if you start from here, one, one, then you go to one, two, and then uh, you get a minus 0 0.04, and then eventually uh, you get to four, three, where you get plus one, then you go to one, two, one, two, one, three, two, three, 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 two, three, three, and four, three, and you get finally plus one. And then you go to, if you do this, you get minus one at the end of the day. So that's basically, uh, uh, you try to follow the policy for many epochs, and then you finally get a, a evaluation of how the, uh, basically, uh, this looks like. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so the, so basically the first way of uh, doing this is direct utility estimation. So basically what you do is that uh, um, you uh, uh, estimate U pi S as average towards uh, rewards of approach containing S, can co co calculating S from to the end of epoch. So basically first you evaluate, and then you basically uh, try to uh, get uh, 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 S at the end, uh, whatever reward you get to all the states, uh, so, for example, this is the example of uh, uh, direct utility estimation. Uh, this is basically the same sequence, the first one that we used here. And uh, basically what we are saying is that we have visited one one once. So uh, this uh, would be discounted and uh, with minus 0 0.04. So it will be basically 0 0.96. Uh, the utility of uh, going into 3.3 three is basically 1 minus 0 0.04, 0 0.96. Whereas in 1.2, we went once twice so it would be basically divided by two uh, and it would be discounted as well and 0 0.1 is uh, 0 0.72 because it is coming with a discounting factor and with 1 2 it is basically 0 0.76 for uh, this one and 0 0.84 for this one so 0 0.76 we got by subtracting uh, 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 multiply by 0 0.04 and subtracting by 1 the discounting factor here that we are assuming is 1 so it literally does not have any effect no matter you uh, you know square it or cube it it's always 1 if you discount uh, take a discounting you cannot take a discounting factor more than 1 in any case right so if you take a smaller discounting factor then in that case based on how far you got the reward you will basically multiply Apply it with that number. So, like for example, it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you will basically take gamma to the power six into one, then gamma raised to the power into five into uh, zero point zero four in negative, and so on and so forth. And that's how you will get for this and this. And because one two you is twice, you will basically divide by two. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, this makes sense, and this basically gives you a. Uh, uh, this gives you a common formula to do what, what we just saw in direct utility. And then utility, utilities of states are not uh, independent here. So um, uh, this is an example of uh, where direct utility estimation does poorly. So uh, a new state is reached for the first time and then follows the path marked by the dashed lines, reaching a terminal state with reward one. And the you knew uh, for uh, this one is 0 0.96, even though for the neighboring node, U old is minus 0 0.8. So um, uh, uh, if you get this correctly, what it is basically trying to do is that um, you basically reach new for the first time, and you're basically trying to uh, see and by a matter of some randomness or just because of trial and error, you reach the terminal state of plus one. Now, the probability of going to uh, minus one from the old state is 0 0.9. Uh, and uh, the only transition from new state to the old state is basically uh, just one state. And so uh, by this property, the U for a new state would be uh, 0 0.96, which would be uh, problematic because uh, now uh, there will be a huge tendency to come here while uh, uh, neighboring node is very, very small and the probability that it will take you to minus one is high. And so even though you will end up here, you will keep on going to minus one. So the other one is adaptive dynamic programming, ADP. 
and uh, so what it does is that it it learns the transition probability function and reward function r from observation and uh, plugs the values into banbel equation so uh, here uh, there is also a concept of uh, dynamic programming that comes into picture so in dynamic programming what we do is that we build our belief uh, over time based on uh, uh based on basically what we all know and i think uh, you guys would have already been acquainted with the dynamic programming from algo's uh, uh course and the concept is very similar uh so basically uh solves like if you solve the equation of policy evaluation and then uh you basically keep on uh, learning the r and t in this process uh so this is basically uh um adaptive dynamic programming in more detail so uh, you basically try to learn the reward function easy because the function is deterministic whenever you see a new state store the observed reward as rs so basically when you are transitioning from s dash to s uh, you basically store the reward for state s dash and learning that transition model is also kind of easy because every time you are basically taking an action a in state s um, uh, and then you uh, execute uh, uh the action s you basically can get the probability of uh, what is the probability to going to uh, state s dash like for example if you are in state s and you take action a and you reach state s dash and uh, you do that uh, out of three times two times out of three times then the probability of transitioning from state s when you take action a to s dash is 2 by 3 and then to whatever other state that you go would be 1 by 3 uh and this is basically uh the adp algorithm and that you guys can go through uh the problem with adp so uh the problem is that um, it's a very complex thing because you have to basically update at each and every step and so the uh, cost uh, is very high o n cube uh, and so back gammon back gammon is a game again which can be only be so it it um if you go like the guys would have seen it which can only be solved really through uh you know backtracking uh, in an algorithm kind of world which uh, reinforcement learning is very good in solving so if you use this uh, which is basically dynamic programming then the number of states get exploded to 10 to the power 50 which is very hard to track and uh, yeah so then the final one is temporal difference learning which tries to solve some of the problems that are coming from adp and this is a model free learning so instead of calculating the exact utility for a state can we approximate it and possibly make it less computationally expensive right so we we don't say that uh, that uh, so why the name temporal difference so every time when we basically uh, make a state a uh, transition based on an action and we get a reward we take the difference and that's what basically we add it and that that's why it's called temporal difference and for every time we basically make a difference uh, and that's how we learn it like with a with a learning rate so uh, for an example suppose you see that uh, upi 13 0.84 and upi 2 3.0.92. After the first trial, if the transition between 1.3 to 2.3 happen all the time, you would expect to see uh, uh, u pi 1.3 equals to r 1.3 plus u pi 2.3, and then uh, uh, u pi 1.3 would be uh, basically 0.88. Since you observe u pi 1.3 equals 0.84 in the first trial, it is little lower than 0.88, so you might want to bump it towards 0.88. So that's basically how uh, the temporal difference learning work. You basically take the difference and you keep on adding it. Uh, so we can skip this and. Uh, uh yeah so there is also a concept of learning rate which is added here oh there's some problem one second sorry about that yeah so uh, basically there is also a concept of learning rate uh, uh, that that happens here so basically every time that you want to update the uh, upi you basically update it with a smaller uh, number so that even if there is some noisy uh, some some noise coming off because of your utility observation it will not completely affect 
uh, or there is an outlier, it will not completely change your uh, QPy uh, utility function, right? And so this basically shows uh, the uh, number of trials that are required for the estimation of utility in case of ADD and TD. Uh, and um, uh, yeah. So what are the advantages of ADP? It converges to the true utilities faster. Utility estimates don't vary as much from the true utilities because it is it is deterministic. You always get uh, the true utilities. So, but advantages of TD are way more than AD, ADP and that's why temporal difference learning is used even more. So less computation per observation, um, uh, crude but efficient first op op approximation to ADP and uh, you don't need to build a transition model in order to perform its update. Uh, this is kind of very important. Uh, for this. Uh, this is just a summary of passive RL. And uh, so now let's talk about the active reinforcement learning agents. So we'll talk about two types of active reinforcement learning agent, active ADP and Q learning, right? So Q learning is very important and we'll get to it in a moment, but let's talk about the active ADP, right? So what is the goal of active learning, right? Let's suppose we uh, still have access to some sequence of trials performed by the agent. The goal is again to learn an optimal policy. And as you can see that uh, this is the exact same sequence that was shown us to earlier that one from one, one, we goes to one, two, from one, two, we goes to one, three, then back to uh, one, two, and then back to one, three, and then uh, three, two, then three, three, and then finally to three, four, where the agents get the reward. So active ADP agent, so uh, using the data from its passive trials, the agent learns a transition model T and a reward function R. Uh, with TSAS dash and RS, it has an estimate of the underlying MDP. And uh, it computes the optimal policy by self-solving the Bellman equation using value iteration or policy iteration. So what is a Bellman equation? So Bellman equation is basically coming from um, uh, dynamic programming. So Bellman equation, basically what it does is that it expands as a tree. Not sure if... Uh, shows it in a second. No, it doesn't. So Bellman equation is kind of uh, important. I'll talk about that a little bit. So what it does is that it expands as a tree and as we keep on getting more and more information, it keeps on updating uh, dynamically the, uh, so if we ask you that what is the, uh, you know, uh, value uh, for uh, transitioning from state A to state, what is the reward that you get from transitioning from state S to state S dash? And for uh, making that happen, you basically have to uh, go through multiple states in the middle. What would happen is that it will basically keep on get gathering that information and keep on adding uh, that information together. So now when you have to basically uh, calculate the further uh, rewards, you can basically calculate it uh, from the current set of rewards that you have. And that is very similar to how we do it in dynamic programming. We break it down into smaller problems. We calculate first the smaller problems and that's we, we combine them together to uh, solve the uh, bigger problem at hand. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we get our optimal policy and a greedy agent. What it does is that it starts executing the optimal policy for the learn model at each step. And we saw this uh, epsilon greedy in um, um, uh, last causal analysis as well. And we will we will talk about that in a moment here as well. So the agent finds the lower route to get to the goal state, but never finds the optimal upper route, right? So if, in this case, what it does is that it found a policy. And the policy is that uh, if you are at uh, one one, go to one two, go to one three, then go to two three, then go to three three, and then go to uh, three four, right? Whereas uh, we know by a matter of fact that the in the optimal policy, the uh, value from uh, uh, the arrow from this one, the arrow from one two should be up here. Right, because if it is down here, what would happen is that if the agent is in this box, it will have to take a longer path. And every time it takes a like box, it has to the reward goes down by minus 0 0.04. So it will basically be here. Then it will go one, two, three, four, five, and six. On the other hand, if the agent is here and if it takes this path, then it would go one, two, three, four. And in four, oh, sorry, in four um, hopes, it will be here at the reward state. So basically, uh, ultimately, the one two uh, arrow in the one two box should be uh, rotated. 
And uh, but in this case, uh, the greedy exploitation, the agent is stubborn and does not change. So it does not learn the true utilities or the true optimal policy ever. And that's uh, where we come epsilon greedy. So why does choosing an optimal action? Yeah, the learning learn model is not the same as the true environment. So while we are basically actively learning, we don't know that whole environment, right? And just by the experience that we got in this execution, we got to this particular um, uh, kind of state, right? So we need more training experience and we need to go to exploration. And uh, we have to basically balance the exploitation versus exploration. So what is exploitation? Exploitation is that we already know that by studying uh, reinforcement learning, we will get, or by coming to this lecture, uh, we will learn uh, uh, reinforcement learning. And so that's basically you are exploiting, right? You are you come to this lecture and you learn it. Whereas exploration is that maybe one of you might think one day that, oh, I don't want to spend my one and a half hours in this lecture. I would rather go and you know, choose a tutorial of my choice and see if the learning would work or not, right? And that is basically exploration. And if uh, that works better, then the agent would basically update their uh, policy saying that, okay, by taking the uh, online tutorial, it works better than going to a lecture in this AICT sponsored conference, right? And so that's where uh, uh, pure exploitation, you get stuck in a rut, pure exploration, you keep on exploring and you can never get a, uh, uh final policy that you can make use to so what is the optimal exploration policy greedy of course not random uh maybe mixed yeah sometimes use greedy sometimes use random uh, would actually make sense and that's where absolute greedy exploration comes into picture so choose optimal policy action optimal action with probability one minus e but with the uh, uh, probability epsilon, you basically choose uh, action uh, which is uh, not given by the optimal policy, right? And then you can keep on decreasing epsilon over time and ultimately you will uh, reach by uh, by doing this again and again, you will reach the optimal policy. Uh, so you can uh, take an example here, uh, like uh, for example, what you will do if you have to take an action is that uh, suppose you know that if you want to go from MIET to uh, Bhagpat, and this is a very funny uh, example. So one way of going that would doing that would be that you start from MIT, take a left, and go to go through Shamli, and then go towards uh, take the Shamli bypass and go towards Bhagpat, and that is your optimal policy. That that's all what you need. What you need to know, even though it is a longer policy, it takes like. Uh, say 50 kilometers, but then one fine day, what you will do is that, oh, I'm fed up of this with a probability of 0 0.2. You will basically come toss a coin and you will say that, okay, uh, I got a number 0 0.7. So I will take my optimal policy, which is going to Shamli and going to Bakpat. But then one fine day, once you toss the coin, you get a value 0 0.1. And then you say that, okay, I'm going to explore this time. And instead of taking left from my mighty, you take a right and basically you start moving towards the like, you know, direct road to Bhagpat and then you find, oh my God, I was always in you know darkness. It takes only 30 kilometers to reach Bhagpat through this route. And then you update your policy and that's now your more optimal policy. Now there's a possibility that there might be a better route, who knows? And so you will keep on tossing this coin and then one fine day, uh, you will basically try to explore something more, more and then you will take that path uh, and then you will uh, you know, know a better policy. So start with initial tree and R, learn from original sequence of trials, compute the utilities of state US, take action, use the epsilon greedy exploitation exploration strategy, update TNR, go to two, and keep on repeating. Uh, another approach is favor actions the agent has not tried very often, avoid actions believed to be of low utility. So you can always think that, okay, even, even when you are trying to explore, you can choose only actions that are higher utility as compared to the low utility actions so that you can basically converge faster and uh, achieve uh, this is achieved by altering value iteration to use u plus s which is an optimistic estimate of the utility of the status using an exploration function uh, so uh, Yeah, so basically the original uh, exploration function for you would be uh, RS plus gamma, which is discounting factor plus max. Uh, this, uh, like what is the action A, which gives you the maximum uh, reward 
once you go from state s to state s dash using your uh, utility function and with exploration function what it will come down to is that you will take a function f which is basically um, uh, gives you the final utility um, of exploration and the u plus s is the optimistic estimate of the utility of state s and then nas is basically the number of times action a tried in state s right and so based on that you will basically define uh, what action you should take when you are basically trying to explore Uh, so this is basically using your exploration function start with initial tr uh, then perform value iteration to compute u plus using the exploration function take the greedy action update the estimated model and go to two uh, and then uh, q learning which is kind of important uh, we are reaching 330 fast i'm trying to rush through it so that we get a little bit more time for our exercise here uh, so q learning uh, previously we need to store utility values for a state so we will we, we were basically supposed to save utility for each and every state and it is equal to expected sum of future rewards so like for example uh, um, uh, if we know that on an average by being in this state and by taking the actions later i get a reward of uh, 0.6 right so uh, to to understand this better let's go back to uh the same example that we did earlier so what is an expected reward so the expected reward of being in uh, state uh the expected reward of being in state uh 330.96 because we know that the next hop is uh, basically giving us a reward the expected reward of being in state 11 is 0.72 and 12 is 0.8 because we went in this multiple times right so um yeah so uh, uh we need to store so equal to expected sum of future rewards now we will store q values which are defined as value of taking action a at state s right so it is basically um uh, it, it, now the state is tied to an action as well so what we say is that if we take an action a in the state s what would be the value that we will get and so for each state instead of just saving the utility of state s we will start storing a table so for every state s we will basically start saving a table that what will be the value if we take action a in state s right and the uh, uh, one which we will be using is basically maximizing uh, this function and saying that okay the utility s would be nothing but uh, uh, so the relationship between the utility function and the q, q value is nothing but uh, you know what would be the action that will be taken in state s that will maximize the my q value and that is basically gives you the utility function right uh, so example of how we can get the utility us from the q table it's just basically uh, evaluating this formula so q11 up is 0.87 q11 right is 0.65 q11 left is 0.09 and q11 down is 0.11 right i think this is coming from the same uh, same same one Let me see. Yeah. So basically, what it is saying is that if you are in this one and you to go to right, it's zero point six eight. If you go down, it's zero point seven six two. I'm going back to the original one. and uh, so the utility represent the goodness of the best action of course right so like for example if you are in 11 the uh, goodness of action of going to 0. Point, uh, up is 0.87 which is the best one here so that is the uh, best action to take uh, so what is the benefit of calculating qsa over calculating the uh, uh, utility function so if you estimate qas for all a and s you can simply choose the action that maximizes q without needing to derive a model of the environment and solve an mdp so basically uh, uh um you can always say that okay i will choose the action that is maximizing my q value and 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 that's it you don't have to worry about 
uh, the whole MDP equation in which you have to basically calculate the transition probability and you also have to calculate the reward probability and so on and so forth. Uh, and the, very, the, the, the uh, Q learning is uh, very similar to the formula is very similar to the utility function. So it's basically saying that uh, what is the probability of uh, uh, going from uh, S to S dash uh, in A and what is the utility function here, um, uh, which is basically the expected value uh, that you get average over uh, all the possible states S and then the reward that you get in state S. That is basically the uh, Q value for, you know, being in state S and taking action A. And uh, this can also be replaced because this is nothing but uh, A dash so that uh, uh, the Q value is maximized. And so you can keep on iterating that over and over and then you basically get the optimized QAS. Uh, so it says, but this still requires a uh, transition function. Can we do this calculation in a model free way? Uh, of course you can, because uh, once you basically uh, go to temporal difference learning, uh, which is model free, you can basically just replace that with the, um, uh, an, a, a learning rate here. And then you can basically replace this with uh, QAS and you can keep on updating the QAS with a learning rate and every time uh, basically the Q value that you get in this particular state. So basically what you say is that the new updated QAS is the current QAS value uh, plus alpha times the learning rate times reward uh, plus uh, the Q value that we get in uh, the current state with uh, the current action that basically what we want to take and uh, we subtract the Q value of the um, the new uh, the, the last uh, the state that we want to go in what is the Q value of that state and and basically update the Q out iteratively and this is the beauty of Q learning because it is model free uh, with this equation and then you can keep on updating it and ultimately you will basically achieve the optimal Q value yeah that's the summary it's guaranteed to converge uh, to an optimal policy very very general process procedure and it's the most widely used. Uh, of course, it converges slower than ADP, as we saw in the temporal difference learning as well. But uh, um, it, it's totally fine the further advantages that we get out of it. And I think that's all that I had uh, to share uh, in the presentation. We are at 3.30 mark right now. If you guys have any questions, I can take them for five minutes and then we can move. There's some chat going on here. Oh, you guys cannot hear me? You are Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. Are I, okay, okay. Okay, so any questions here, guys? This was a very, very brief introduction to reinforcement learning. If you guys want to read more about it, there is a book with name uh, Barto and Sutan. It's uh, available uh, online, available uh, free of cost, right? Uh, this book, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction. I would suggest you to buy this if you guys can, uh, but uh, you can also download it online. And this is the Bible for Reinforcement Learning. I've read it once. I'm in the process of reading it second time. I think this will basically help you guys uh, get better in this over time. And uh, what I have shown is basically just an introduction of the whole thing. Once you get into this, you will. There is a chapter to like a set of slides that I have given, and then uh, it basically gives you the whole information about uh, you know a lot of different things that we have like get into the depth of a lot of different things that I have just touched, touched upon. A very good book to follow. So now, are you guys ready to go to the you know workshop that we wanted to do? Okay. Yeah, a lot of people said audible. That means that people are still, you know, listening to me. It's uh, it's afternoon and yeah, it gets a little bit difficult. So hope you guys would have downloaded it. And so uh, if you are on Kaggle, uh, you can go to the notebook section and you can see that um, you will see some of the notebooks that are famously there, uh, done by other people. But you can just go and say a new notebook, and it will open a new notebook for you. Please follow along. And we will first start by uploading our first notebook. So go on file and say upload. 
once you say upload go and upload the play the game dot ipynb here i will wait for people to say done uh like one or two people to say done here and i'm going to get some water okay fair enough i got one done here so let's take a look so i'm 100% sure that everyone here would have played this game uh you know in their childhood i have played so basically this is a very simplistic game there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 available columns that uh, you can decide from uh, to put your uh, you know coin in and there are two color coins here and uh, based on the person who gets a consecutive four coins wins and the four coins can be in any uh, way it can be diagonally it can be horizontally or it can be vertically right so this is basically uh, what it is and and then uh, you can uh, start executing this whole thing with me so uh, if we execute this this basically set up your environment and then uh, what we have done is that we have set up a uh, uh, we are basically trying to create the uh, random um, uh, uh, kind of uh, environment here and so the random uh, the random agent basically what it does is that there it will show you two random agents playing and what the random agent while they are playing would do is that they will randomly throw the they will toss a coin uh, and with whatever value they get between 1 to 7 they will basically put the coin in one of these uh, columns and based on that uh, the game would proceed so let's just uh, run this particular uh, thing and as you can see uh, this is actually a real game play going on and this is being randomly played until someone wins so finally uh, uh, the second person wins right we can run it again and we will see the game being played now this is the power of kaggle and uh, like uh, specific yeah was there a question ah uh, okay size of the screen yeah so as you can see that there are two players playing and there is the, the the two players who are playing are basically random and random and uh, you can see that uh, when they play uh, they are just randomly throwing uh, um uh, you know uh, things inside and then eventually one of them would win right and maybe it can be to draw as well so yeah even though this guy had a, a opportunity to basically put it in here but it did not else the green one would have won but the gray one won right so now uh, basically um, it basically defines you how you can define your agents and everything so uh, the, if you want to define your ag random agent what you can do is that uh, you can uh, basically through the valid moves you can basically just do a random choice if you want to choose a agent which basically always put in the middle you can do it in this way if you want to basically create a agent which basically takes uh, the leftmost agent which always put in the leftmost one you can do it in this way and uh, that's basically what it shows and so you can take a random agent and a leftmost agent so the leftmost agent will get the first chance and you can see them playing and then the agent random will get the second chance and the leftmost agent the policy that the leftmost agent uses that i will always put it into the leftmost uh uh column right so you can see oh sorry i forgot to execute these cells so the functions are not available 
so once this game goes so this guy is always putting on the left right you see this always putting on the left still it is able to win because this random guy is so stupid that it does not know what to do at least by a matter of fact it is always putting on the left so there is a high probability that it will be able to get those four things uh, together in the in one go now let's try to see if we try to play the leftmost agent with the leftmost agent right so this will always try to put everything on the left right you see this left 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 now still the green one will whip in obviously because it got the first chance and then also we can try to let it play with the agent middle and we can see that the middle world will keep on putting it here right now just to show you that this is actually completely happening according to how it is supposed to be if i exchange the agent middle and agent left most then this would basically uh, show that agent middle will be win because the middle agent got the first chance so re reverting it back to the random and see so we we, we will see that what is the percentage of wins um if we basically choose these two agents the middle agent and the random agent and the, the leftmost agent and the random agent so basically uh agent win one win 66 per, uh, 66% times and uh, uh and then agent two wins 0.01% times uh and then in second case uh, agent one wins 78% of the time while the agent two wins 22% of the time and so we can go ahead and upload the our next uh, 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 notebook so this one is one step look at so let's talk about this a little bit time check we have 20 minutes so when you play chess or when you play a game like this what do you guys actually think you think that okay if i put my coin in this column then you try to think about oh where would the opponent put their coin in okay and then you think okay if the opponent will put their coin in this column then i can put it in this column and you keep on thinking like you know forward and forward and then at the end you see oh if i keep on doing this and my opponent keeps on doing this then i will win the game right so you see that there is a discounted reward thing happening here so you know that if you keep on doing this you will get the reward at the end and then you discount that reward one by one to each and every uh, step now there is a total possibility that once you take a step your opponent might not take the step that you decided and it might change it might you might have to change your policy based on that information but once you are you are trying to basically design your optimal policy in the current state you are you basically try to do that and uh like discount the reward uh by 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 thinking ahead and that's basically what this particular agent is going to do so it's going to think one step ahead okay and it explains it a little bit but uh, let me show you what it will do so what it is saying is that if my uh uh if my agent is going to if my next step the agent is going to go to a state where there is one complete row with all four or like diagonally all four or anything it will get a lot of points like how many 1 million points 10 lakh points right yeah 1 million points right if it basically goes to a state where three are consecutive and only one is empty it gets one point whereas if it does something that leads to the opponent going to a state where three are there and only one net left we basically punish it we take 100 points out of the points right and so uh, it gives an example here suppose the state of the current state is this so it has 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 possible actions that it can take which takes it to a different state now it is basically try to calculate what is the best possible reward that it will get in the next state so this is basically the best reward one because it gets two points here it gets one point and in the rest it gets zero point in this one also it gets one point and so on and so forth so it will basically try to take this move right and so let's see the code that is written 
so this is basically the code i uh, don't worry about the drop piece but uh, the uh, get heuristic is kind of important uh, so it basically score the moves so it calculates the value of heuristics for your uh, grid so it basically tries to make sure that what is the score of each and every uh, uh, grid and then uh, the score move function is basically being called and then your agent is here so basically what it gets it it tries to get the valid moves then uh, it basically tries to based on the uh, valid moves it basically tries to get scores for each and every valid move and then it tries to find the maximum column that will uh, basically help it uh, attain the maximum uh, uh, score and based on that it basically gives you the choice now you might think it is random dot choice but it is only giving so what it is saying is that if there are two or three moves which gives you the same score right then choose one among them randomly now this can also be optimized in some sense but that's basically what it is doing at this point of time right so let's try to execute this and see what happens by only doing this you will see that our agent will become you know multifold better let's try to play the game again so now what we are doing is that uh, this is not good let me just change it That's random. So it's basically trying to play against a random one. And as you can see, that it wins so fast, right? You see, it's basically winning very fast because it can get them. And if you see the you know, weight in which it is playing, you will see that it is thinking of an optimal policy right so first it started with here right then it basically started uh, by putting it here but when it saw that this guy has already put three here instead of trying to win it basically put one here so you see this it first put here and then at the end it tries to put here because we have penalized our uh, uh, our agent to go in this state so every time it goes into this state it gets penalized right so that's basically what it is and then we want to get the win percentage in this case so actually i was experimenting but let's try to let it play with a random one Yeah, this at this point uh, it gets a little bit smart. So the agent is winning 98% of the times, right? Always it is winning, and the random one is basically losing. Now, if we try to, it actually continues for a very long time. But we can try to let the agent play with each other, right? And it will basically uh, take forever the calculation to complete. But what I want to show you is that it takes this much time to basically complete. And uh, let's try to uh, open our last one so let's try to do this play the game and then from this one let's copy our agent Okay, I want to copy the agent which was doing, let's say, leftmost one. All right, and let's put it here. But if we take an agent which is basically doing the leftmost all the time, right, and we take this agent and we put it here, what would be the percentage of wins? So if you see the leftmost person always loses always because the agent is able to figure out the behavior and uh, it basically always uh, tries to remove it and i can show this behavior to you here as well 
if you want to see one instance. You see, it always stops it from winning. Always. Like you can do it n number of times and it will always stop it from winning. So, yeah. In fact, if it can, so every time we actually run this, it cannot retain its policy. But if it can retain its policy, it will not even give it stand, this, this person a chance to basically win. Uh, like it will always do the exact same thing by putting four things in the middle and that's it. It will always win. So that's basically uh, another thing. Time check. 347. Okay, we have 13 more minutes, right? Any questions so far, guys? Oh, it's not working in your Kaggle? Okay, perfect. I'm glad it's working for you guys. Uh, please feel free to go through it uh, in your free time. Any questions that you guys want to ask? Okay, I'll take that as no. Uh, feel free to unmute or stop myself whenever you feel. Okay. So in the notebooks, I have a deep learning one as well. I will not go through that in uh, lieu of time. And I want you guys to basically ask me any uh, uh, questions other than uh, the one like which like from the session. But uh, yeah. Uh, this is basically what it is trying to do is that it is trying to look n steps in uh, ahead. So n steps ahead, like uh, what would happen if we basically train the model to look n steps ahead and this will basically make it even smarter. So uh, the, the points remain same in this. What we have just added is that it can see n steps ahead and it, if, it, if, if, it, if the action that this particular agent is taking leads to an action which will make the user get this, we penalize the uh, agent with minus 10,000 points. Now, always make sure that this is higher than this because the agent generally does not understand the difference between negative and positive. Right. And sometimes it basically starts optimizing this and you will see that the agent is continuously losing. So it can be negative or positive. It doesn't matter. Just the opposite sign. So let's see. This guy playing against the random one. It takes forever to execute. So you can imagine it's taking time because it has to be basically every step think and steps ahead. And because of that, that's why it is basically failing. Let's try to do a play with agent versus agent and see how this goes. So it is taking even more time because now both the agents will be taking a lot of time to basically, uh, you know, trying to figure out. So, yeah, this basically uh, shows that these agents are fighting with each other. And every time we execute it, the agent tries to create its policy again. But if we can retain that policy in some way and utilize it, it's going to get better and better over time with each and every play. It's going to get better and better. So with this, I will basically stop. And uh, I will let you guys ask any questions related to my profession, what I do. If you have any other questions for me related to digital marketing, machine learning and digital marketing, uh, I would love to answer those questions.
collaborative learning i have not uh, heard of this thing i have not heard of collaborative learning if you can tell me what it is and give a little bit of context feel free to uh, unmute yourself we can we can talk uh, that's that's fine um so as i told in the beginning there are two things that we are doing uh, so uh, i am a lead architect in a hello yeah hello. Uh, sorry to in interrupt you but uh, collaborative learning i heard this is generally used in the recommendation systems so you mean you mean collaborative filtering yeah you can see the collaborative filtering yeah 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 that is uh, correct correct collaborative yeah. filtering yeah yeah so collaborating filtering i think it's a so we have moved way far away with recommendation algorithms right so collaborative filtering is basically uh, just use uh, there are you, there are two ways of doing collaborative filtering user user filtering and item item filtering and what we say is that uh, like if user 1 is interested in um, xyz and then uh, user 2 is also interested in xyz and then user 1 uh, is also interested in pqr then there is a very high chance that user one, user 2 would also be interested in pqr and we basically recommend them there are algorithms around it where you can mathematically learn this uh, relationship yeah it's a, it's a very beautiful concept to use uh, but there are better deep learning based algorithms nowadays which do much better than collaborative filtering yeah. uh, which which uh, which concept uh, you told me which is better than this collaborative learning so if you just uh, search for recommendation algorithms based on uh, uh, some of the recommendation algorithms in deep learning so i can talk about a specific thing so what we have done recently is uh, convert all the uh, you know um, uh, all the uh, uh, behavioral uh, variables for a customer into embeddings so represented all the users with uh, um, a certain vector of like say size 100 so what we do basically is that uh, suppose a customer is highly interested in apple devices and then uh, they are also interested in suppose um, um, groceries on amazon then what we what, what what you can do is that you can represent these as their behavioral attributes then uh, we convert them into user embeddings so you can look up uh, like user embeddings on uh, online and uh, uh, then what we do is that we basically go into the space of user embeddings and we try to calculate the uh, uh, similarity in those users now the similarity can be are uh, done in uh, using any distance metric like um, even euclidean distance or something like that and then based on the similarity if there are two people who are similar we basically uh, recommend the uh, things that are uh, liked by user 1 to user 2 and this has proved uh, very good results uh, uh, for 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 some adobe.com help documentation okay okay so thank you yeah. very much yeah sure so there was a there is a question from aruna about type of pro projects currently working so we are actually working on a you know highly scalable platform where uh, the internal data scientist within adobe so a lot of data scientists come from statistics background and machine learning background and they are not very good with software engineering related practices so we we are building a platform where they can basically bring their jupyter notebooks as i showed you uh, and uh, you know we would help them uh, operationalize operationalize their uh, you know uh, uh, models that are built through jupyter notebooks in real uh, running production code uh, so that our customers uh, in this case the enterprise customers can utilize them to run their uh, you know machine learning needs and the other project other two three projects that i'm working on one project that i'm working on is data generation so basically we have a huge problem with you know data being available from our customers so all of our enterprise customers they don't want to give adobe data for 
I mean, experimentation purpose. And a few of them which give, they also try to anonymize it and the amount of data that is given is very, very small. So we are working on a, a project that would basically um, uh, uh, help us take this, uh, we are using, uh, you know, CD GAN, uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, to basically take this data and generate more data out of it. So like given 1 million rows, we should be able to, uh, you know, generate 10 million rows out of this uh, data. Uh, another project that we are currently working on is using causal analysis uh, and like trying to help our customers uh, market their, uh, you know, uh, customers better by making sure that uh, the customers that they are marketing uh, would actually convert. So these are the three projects that I'm working on right now. Yeah, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are at the top of the hour. It's almost 4 p.m. So I think we can call it a day, Nidhi. Sure, it. Thank you very much for the session. And uh, the participants must have learned a lot today. The whole day was yours only. And new industrial concepts uh, they have been acquainted with. Thank you very much for this. Hope we will be connected in future also. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks guys uh, for attending and uh, yeah, spending time for full day. Yeah, let me know if you have any questions by hitting me on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day.